Welcome to the next episode of the Dark Web Deacon. Before we begin, be sure to smash that subscribe button, click the bell to turn on notifications. New videos are published every Monday and Thursday, and as always, be sure to like and provide comments. If you have ever wondered how the cybersecurity expert and IT firms go after the bad guys or try to analyze what they are going to do next, well, one way is something called a honeypot. You see, in addition to security measures you might expect, such as strengthening a computer network to keep out cyber criminals, the cyber experts use a honeypot to do the opposite, attract the bad guys. Honeypots are closely monitored decoys that are employed in a network to study the trail of hackers and to alert network administrators of possible intrusion. Honeypots provide a cost-effective solution to increase the security posture of any organization. Nowadays, they are also being extensively used by the research community to study issues in network security. Honeypots have several real-world applications. They serve as network decoys, as we mentioned earlier, to prevent attacks on an organization's real networks by appearing to be easy targets. By tracking all activity on a honeypot, such as viruses and worms, so they can, they can be more easily detected. In addition, honeypots can be used to combat spam. The idea of honeypots began in 1991 with two publications, The Cuckoo's Egg and An Evening with Burford. The Cuckoo's Egg by Clifford Stoll was about his experience catching a computer hacker that was in his company's network searching for secrets. The other publication, An Evening with Burford by Bill Chewick, is about a computer hacker's moves through the traps that he and his colleagues used to catch him. In both of these writings, it was the beginning of what became known as computer honeypots. The first type of honeypot was released in 1997, called the Deceptive Toolkit. The point of this kit is to use deception to attack back. In 1998, the first commercial honeypot came out. This was called Cybercop Sting. Honeypots are shared and used all over the world. And this technology continues to improve, and many honeypot users feel this is just the beginning and they're only gonna get better. Looking beyond computers, the idea of honeypots has been around for decades. The principle behind them is pretty simple. Don't go looking for attackers. Prepare something that would attract their interest, AKA the honeypot, and then wait for the attacker to show up. For example, a cheese bait, baited mousetrap is a classic example. Or let's say a neighborhood that's been burglarized a lot. So someone sets up a camera outside their home and leaves a bike outside for them to steal, which would act as the honeypot. There are two common questions that often are brought up when discussing honeypots. One is, is a honeypot just a computer? And two, how do honeypots work? Well, honeypots often are just computers but they can also be other things in the form of data records, idle IP address spaces, or files. They must be handled carefully as there are chances of hazards being carried out on the network. A hacker can make use of a honeypot to break into a system. Hence, it should always be walled off appropriately from the rest of the network. In regards to how it works, let's assume you're the CTO of a large bank. So you may wanna set up a honeypot system that to the outside user looks as if it's part of your banking network. Honeypots are generally based on a real server, a real operating system, and with data that appears to be real. You would then set up extensive monitoring of these systems, networks, and software so you can better understand where cyber criminals are coming from, how they operate, and what they want. More importantly, you can determine which security measures you have in place are working and which ones you need to improve. On the basis of implementation, honeypots can be categorized as either low-involved or high-involved honeypots. So what's the difference? A typical low-involved honeypot will have a few ports open so that the administrator knows what ports the attackers are trying to connect to. The attacker will not be allowed to do anything else on the low-involved honeypot. Hence, low-involved honeypots are relatively low risk. Low involved do not give you much insight into what the attacker wants or what they may do once they're inside your network. Hence, they are normally used as production honeypots. A typical high involved honeypot, however, 
will have, for example, a few ports open and a few vulnerable services running. Hence, the attacker is allowed to actually break into the honeypot. The attacker is allowed to do anything he wants to that highly involved honeypot. So, the high involved honeypots are considered relatively risky. High involved honeypots can be used to gather a lot of insight on the tools, techniques, and methods used by the attacker. Hence, they are normally used for research. A recent example of how highly involved research-oriented honeypots can be leveraged was performed by Symantec. They set up a honeypot to attract attackers to a so-called Internet of Things network. These are internet-connected items such as home routers, digital video cameras, home cameras, and smart appliances. Symantec's IoT honeypot worked great. Attacks on the honeypot almost doubled from January to December. There is a lot experts can learn from honeypots. In the case of Symantec's IoT honeypot, researchers were able to determine such things as countries from which attacks originated, China, the US, Russia, Germany, and Vietnam made up the top five, passwords attempted on these devices, admin was number one, one, two, three, four, five, six, wasn't too far behind, and the need to baseline security standards on IoT-related devices to make them less vulnerable to attack. Thanks for watching, and as always, please like, subscribe, and provide comments, and turn on notifications by clicking the bell in order to check out future videos published twice a week.